Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a weekly Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a talk show in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, anything in between, whatever we feel like talking about. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show. I'm Ken Michaels. Some of you might know me from my other weekly Beatles show, a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three other co-hosts, first of all. One of the writers, longtime writer for our Beatle Fan magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also another writer for Beatle Fan and freelance writer and musicologist, Alan Cozen. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also we have the writer for the number one Beatles news source on the Internet, Beatles Examiner, and that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everyone. On the program this time, uh, we're going to be talking about miracles, miracles that the Beatles achieved while they were together, and to be more specific, with their music, things that they did in the studio, things that have really impressed the four of us, things that we can point out to and say, wow, how did they ever achieve that? Or, you know, it was really quite an accomplishment, something really special that we can point to that uh, all four of us will talk about here on the show and we'll give examples and talk about why we think that these are miracles and there's no doubt about it we all love that Beatles catalog and we cherish it and we feel it's the greatest catalog that's ever been recorded but we're gonna pinpoint certain examples of songs that we think were even more special for certain reasons so why don't we start the show by well, let's hear from Al Sussman and have him talk about one of those miracles. Al? Well, this is something that actually I wrote about some years ago. In fact, I think it was probably more than some years ago in, uh, in Beatle Fan because I did a, did a piece on the summer of 1969. And if you remember the summer of, of 1969, some fairly extraordinary things happened that, um, that some people might term as miracles. You know, there was a moon landing that probably might have ended up being, um, could have ended up being a disaster if it hadn't been for Neil Armstrong piloting the, uh, the Eagle. And, uh, mm. and uh, I mean, literally manually piloting it to the Sea of Tranquility. And a couple of weeks later, uh, there was the Woodstock Music and Art Fair which could have been an absolute disaster. In fact, uh, the, the, the state of New York declared uh, Yasker's Farm a, um, a disaster area, but it turned out to be anything but a disaster and turned out to be the, uh, probably the best remembered of all of the, the pop festivals uh, over, the, over the years. And, of course, there was also a certain baseball team out of Flushing that mm -hmm. and that had uh, in its uh, previous seven years of existence never won more than seventy two games, and uh, by October sixteenth they had won uh, one hundred and one hundred and eight games and had won the World Series and their story was unfolding. In fact, uh, the uh, the sort of the final chapter of it began unfolding the weekend of Woodstock, and then there was Abbey Road. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody who obviously has seen Let It Be knows what and also has seen all of, has read all of the stories about what was going on during the White Album sessions, knows of the, the incredible tensions and building tensions that were going on between the Beatles during 19, the second half of 1968 and the first months of 69. And yet, in that summer of 69, they were able to put, and, and, and those tensions were getting, were being exacerbated by all of the business hassles that were going on at Apple. So the group was absolutely disintegrating, and yet, in that summer, they were able to somehow put aside all of those differences 
and go into the studio and made what many people consider to be their finest album and certainly one of the finest albums of the 1960s, Abbey Road. So I would consider mm -hmm. that probably the, the greatest miracle of, um, of, of the Beatles' career as a group. Interesting. Anybody want to bounce off that? Yeah, you know, I, that was actually one of the ones on my list. Um, <laughs> and, and in particular, side two of Abbey Road. And to narrow yes. it down even further, you know, the last part of side two. Yes. Um, you know, when the 2009 remasters came out, I put that on a really good stereo and cranked it up. And I mean, I was like close to in tears. I uh -huh. mean, it just is so good and you think okay. of the state that that band was supposedly in yeah. and the fact that they were not notoriously known as a jam band you know it it, it it just wasn't their thing and yet the dialogue between the three guitars uh, in the end and uh Ringo taking close to a drum solo even though it's very minimalist it somehow is is perfect for that and uh and just the the interplay between all of them and then leading up to that ending, you know, with and in the end, the, the love you take. Yeah. Forgetting about Her Majesty, of course, which was yes. sort of a <laughs> funny, funny tack on surprise. But, um, you know, that was just so perfect. Yeah. You know, for, for mm -hmm. the time, for, for, for the state they were in, for everything. And, and just hearing it again in a really good transfer mm -hmm. on a good system at, you know, a, a good visceral volume. I wasn't blasting my neighbors out, but mm -hmm. you know, it was <laughs> loud enough to envelop you. Um, and this is, I, I recommend to anybody listening to sort of do that because, you know, you think about Abbey road and you think about come together in something and here comes the sun and, you know, and they're all great spectacular songs, but that last bit of the album yeah. is just so incredible. So, Yeah. Anyone else? I have. I have to agree. I mean, it's uh, it's just there's there's you really can't put it into words. Almost. I mean, it's it's that much of a you know. Every time it comes on the radio, you just kind of have to sit there and just go, wow, just listen to it. You know, even the even the um, the outtakes that have floated around don't you know don't do the album justice. I mean, they you know it's it's great to have the the original album uh, there. You know, so you can hear it. Uh, it. It really is kind of amazing. I don't know how many times I've cranked up that drum solo, and I mean, really cranked it. You know, I mean, it's just amazing. And you know, they've denied that that they that they knew that that was going to be their you know their last the last track on the last Beatles album, but you know, I don't know mm. whether it's Kiss or whatever. Uh, it. Uh, you know, I, it, it's it, it's the most perfect ending to the yeah. story of a of a of a of a major band that you could almost possibly have. Mm -hmm. I think th I mm -hmm. think they kind of knew. I mean, yeah. there there is this story about them getting together in October, right, as the album was released, and and talking about doing something else. So maybe they didn't totally know, but um, I once had a talk with John Kurlander, who was one of the engineers on that album. And he said that they definitely knew it was their last album. And, and that was one of the reasons, apart from a convenient cigarette pack, that they wanted to call it Everest. They wanted to basically say, you know, using Everest as the mountain, um, which yeah. at the time was not thought to be smaller than K2, right. um, <laughs> that, you know, that we're, we're, we're stopping and we're stopping when we're on top, not because no one's interested anymore. Yeah. Um, and they, and they wanted to, the, the, the plan, according to Kurlander was that they would all be flown to Everest to take the cover photo. But, none of them could really be bothered. And, and Paul sort of, you know, made his little drawing of the cover and said, why don't we just go out in the street and take the photo? And that's sort of how Abbey Road became Abbey Road instead of Everest. But, but there was some thought at least that, that, that this was going to be their swan song, you know, mm. they probably knew that when that you hear was gonna come out after, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you hear Paul say that he asked George Martin to, 
to come back and produce them. And George Martin said, but yeah, but you got to be on your best behavior here. I think that they kind of knew. But yeah, like like Al said, I've heard Ringo say even recently that um, they didn't know it was going to be the last album or the last song. But one other thing about Abbey Road, and actually that's one of the miracles that I put on my list, is that, and you can't get much better than side two of Abbey Road, no doubt about it. Could be the best Beatles album side. But with the exception of Golden Slumbers and Carry That Weight, all the other songs were not conceived together. Mm -hmm. They were all separate songs. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they all flowed together so well Mm -hmm. when they weren't thought of that way, (laughs) that alone is a miracle. I mean, you'd think that they went into the studio and recorded those songs in that order, and it just flows so perfectly. But that's not the way that um, it was conceived from the very beginning. Right. Yeah. I mean, some of those songs we have in outtakes from Let It Be. You know, Me, Mr. Mustard, John played a bunch of times during mm-hmm. those sessions. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, definitely Abbey Road, one of the greatest miracles. And certainly Side 2. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Got it, but way up there on the list. Mm-hmm. All right, Alan, I'm going to let you have your, your choice now, and I'll bet you it's probably my, my number one choice, too, but I'm going to let you have it anyway. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, Ken. Is your number one choice <laughs> Strawberry Fields? Yes. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> yeah, something about Strawberry Fields, I I just love that track. It's It, it could be my favorite Beatles track of all, and, and that's, you know, as you know, the competition's pretty tough. Strawberry. One of the reasons, possibly, that I feel this way about Strawberry Fields, although although I, I I've always loved it from the time it came out, is that thanks to bootlegs or the miracle of bootlegs, we have basically all of the working materials for Strawberry Fields, starting from when John was in Almeria, Spain, with an acoustic guitar and a cassette mm-hmm. recorder. Um, and had one line of the song written. And then, you know, the next tape, he has two or three lines. And it's not until later in the process that, you know, but, but, but still in Almeria, where he comes up with the let me take you down to strawberry fields part. But then he's got nothing to get mad about instead of nothing to get hung about. It, it's, it's incredible to see this thing unfolding. and And even when they went to Abbey Road and did the first takes, it's beginning with the verse, you know, um, rather than, you know, let me take you down to Strawberry Fields is really the the chorus and the refrain. And it didn't begin with that at first. It, it began with uh, one of the verses. I think, I think actually it began with a different verse than all of the demos started with, uh, Living is Easy. Um, But anyway, um, the thing about Strawberry Fields, it's so incredible, is that it was such a mess. I mean, if you think about the fact that John had done all these demos and you hear a lot of the roots of the song in the demos, then took it into the studio, played it for them on an acoustic guitar, which is beautiful by itself. Then they did the first version, which has that slide, which turns out actually to most likely be a Mellotron, not George. That slide guitar on take one. Because there's a Mellotron guitar sound that sounds exactly like that. Are you sure about that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it, but someone made the case and included a tape of the Mellotron sound, and it's very, very close to that sound, which wasn't really the way George sounded. Even when he was playing Slide Moore, he, he, he didn't go for that sharp sound that you hear. But I don't know. It's, uh, it's possibly George. It may very well be the Mellotron. But in any case, uh, you know, and then uh, on the third verse of, of that first take, they come in with those harmonies like on Because or, you know, some earlier things like uh, Here, There and Everywhere, you know, just that beautiful Beatles harmony thing, which astonishingly when they put out the version of that take on the anthology they didn't include those vocals i have no idea why Mm. Uh, they're on bootlegs they when they had the abbey road show in i think 1983 and they played a film with some of these outtakes they included those vocals but on the anthology they didn't and the funny thing is that you know it also had that beautifully slinky bass sound um which was apparently george because Paul was manning the Mellotron. So John took that home, decided he didn't like it, came in, they started again, opening now with Paul's 
Mellotron flute sounds, um, which is, you know, a signature part of that, you know, of that song. You hear those flutes and yeah, that's Strawberry Field. It could be nothing else, you know. So they, they did, uh, you know, six or seven takes of that. They had a, a decent version, took it home, still didn't like it. Commissioned George Martin to write an orchestral score for which he just used cellos and brass. And I found, um, uh, actually, uh, once, once Mark Lewison let me look through his listening notes. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I noted in there that um, George Martin put in a requisition for, to be paid for his uh, orchestral score for Strawberry Fields. And he earned a mere 36 pounds on that. Wow. <laughs> Wow. So maybe in 1967 it was worth a bit more than it would be now, but still mm-hmm. not much. Mm-hmm. They recorded it that way, an incredible th- version with, um, you know, also the Swarmandel, which is a sort of Indian zither that, you know, contributes again to that special sound that Strawberry Fields has. Finish that version. Oh, oh, and they they started off those sessions doing a drum track with um, Neil Aspinall and Paul joining in on timpani. And it's a very noisy thing. Um, and they intended to use it partly as the underpinning of the, of the end of the piece, but also to have it played backwards. Um, and that sort of, you hear that in the coda. Um, and you also, when you listen to the raw sessions, you hear John say cranberry sauce very clearly, not once, but twice. And, on the on the finished version, you know, it's it it sounds different because it's slowed down. You know, mm. those, George Martin, when he did his orchestral score, moved the key up um, because he wanted to get the open strings of the the lowest open string of the cellos into the thing because he liked that sound. So he moved it up a key, and it was apparently okay for John to sing. They also took it faster. John takes that home, still doesn't like it. Says, "I want you to." make a version that has bits of both of these. And this is where the miracle really happens. I mean, they did a lot of miracles, but this was, you know, this was just an incredible one that the one that was in the higher key was also faster. So you could speed up the slower one, slow down the faster one and the keys met in the middle so that you could make that splice that happens at exactly one minute into the song. Um, it just changes texture and, uh, you know, goes from the band version, the second version into the orchestral version with the heavy drums and the swarm and then George has a guitar solo. And then there's the, then it fades out. You get the backwards drums fades back in with the Mellotron going crazy. Um, and you hear John saying cranberry sauce, although we never knew that he was saying that for not at the time. Certainly. I thought it sounded to me like he's saying I'm very bored for some reason, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when the Paul's dead rumors started, it was, I buried Paul, Uh um, but had the greatest explanation of it. He said, listen, John's saying cranberry sauce. And if you knew John, you would know that he was likely to say something like cranberry sauce at any minute. And, you know, so it didn't seem strange to us. <laughs> but, uh, mm. So, you know, then apart from all of that, you know, what we have here is like a technical miracle that this whole thing came together out of, uh, you know, so many attempts into a sort of Frankenstein version that is just perfect. And beyond that, you've got the lyrics, you know, the lyrics are just incredible. You know, for most of us who knew the backstory, we knew what Strawberry Fields was, or technically it's Strawberry Fields, singular, is that mm. the orphanage, yeah, right. John. But, you know, even if you didn't know that, it's just a nice image, a nice image that evokes, you know, color in your mind, you know, Strawberry Fields, wow, you know. And, mm. and, and it was just, you know, the song was so sort of early psychedelia. And, you know, Strawberry Fields, nothing is real, nothing to get hung about, sung so laconically, you know, and you keep in mind that they just came off this horrific tour where they all had a horrible time every place they went. And, you know, even in the U.S. where there was the John and Jesus thing and they played that show in Memphis and a firecracker went off and everyone Mm. turns to see whether John shot, you know, Uh, and it's uh, you know and this sort of comes out of that you know he's looking at all of these you know what they just went through the fact that they just were not going to do it anymore they were going to 
they were going to go in the studio. That was going to be their life. And, um, and he's just saying, you know, okay, you know, nothing's real, nothing to get hung about. No big deal. We're just doing our thing. And living is easy with eyes closed. Mm. You know, it's, it's <laughs> misunderstanding all you see. It's just great. I can listen to Strawberry Fields over and over and over. And, you know, thanks to the bootlegs, you can listen to it over and over in many, many different <laughs> ways. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was that's my thing about Strawberry Fields. That's that's my uh, top top drawer Beatles miracle. Well, I can't put it any better than you just did, Alan. Mm-hmm. But um, it was my number one choice, too. But the main reason being because of those two different versions. And what is the likelihood that any band is going to record two different takes of a song and have one version be not only faster, but in a, but in a higher key, mm-hmm. you know, and you'll be able to speed one up and slow one down and they're going to match. Yeah. And even if we didn't know the history of all this, if you weren't told that, you probably wouldn't know they were two different takes. Right. Because they really are edited together so well. Yeah. You know, now it's very obvious because we have the knowledge. You know, it's at that one minute point. But it all flows together so well. And uh, it, it's just an incredibly, it's, it's a marvelous recording. Mm-hmm. But um, it's just interesting what you were saying, Alan, about, you know, the key being higher because George Martin wrote an orchestration there for a higher key. Mm-hmm. So, uh you know, but it's just remarkable that that worked out the way it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it could easily not have worked. And, but, you know, it's funny if, if you didn't know all that stuff and you listen to it, you know, with a very sort of analytical musical ear, you would have to say, well, how did they do this? It starts off as a band mm-hmm. and then, you know, and then it becomes something completely else. It, it does, it, the transition is incredibly smooth and yet, You've got two totally different worlds in this song, and it, it's not like an orchestra just comes in and joins them. It's it, the band to some degree falls out, except for the the drums, and then George's guitar comes back in, and um, you know it's it, it really is uh, the, the everything after minute one is so different that if you were to try to analyze, if you were to try to write a score of how this piece is made, you'd be scratching your head, you know, because it's, it's mm-hmm. just so different mm-hmm. and so strange. Yeah. I remember hearing those when the bootlegs first came out with the, uh, with the different takes that just floored me to death. I mean, that was just amazing that, and that even the, you know, you know the few takes that they put on anthology, the anthology, um, are really not enough. I mean, there's there's all those other takes that we we got to hear on the bootlegs that were just absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. And that was mm-hmm. that I think was the the real miracle was they you know they actually uh, combining like you say combining you know whittling this down to what we have. And um, I mean it's it's absolutely beautiful. It's it's and the and the 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 miracle that George Martin was able to take the higher you know the the two divergent takes and basically you know weld them together is astounding and really says a lot about him i mean it's just amazing mm-hmm. and and not just yeah. not just uh um uh, not just strawberry fields but also penny lane and, and the other recordings that were made during the sessions for what became sergeant pepper the amazing mm-hmm. thing that, that i always that just completely floors me especially in the te- the technological age we're in now is that that you know whether it's the best beatles album or not you know that's uh, immaterial but this incredibly textured s- set of recordings with all of these different elements were recorded on four tracks <laughs> mm-hmm. that's un- unbelievable mm-hmm. to think mm-hmm. that that they and you know and and without making it sound muddy as well yeah 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 Yeah. there's one other thing about strawberry fields and i forget where i saw it i'm sure you guys will be able to point it out but i remember seeing george martin in front of the in front of his console Mm -hmm. playing strawberry fields and explaining the very ending there that he faded it down faded down the song and then faded it back up because you had that whole mess of sounds, that yeah. cacophony of sounds, and he felt that you know it wouldn't it would have been a very well, it's still a weird ending anyway, <laughs> but it would have been uh, you know 
a very harsh ending probably for the song if they left it that way. So kind of mm-hmm. by accident, you know, he faded, he brought the faders down, then brought them back up again, and it sounds brilliant yeah. that way. I, I think <laughs> that was the making of Sergeant Pepper. Film. Yes, it was. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But I remember, what, uh, just thinking about, about, about that, um, I remember when I was uh, living in the New York area, uh, I was listening to, I believe, I'm pretty sure it was Dan Ingram on WABC. I think she, I know what you're talking about. And he was playing Strawberry Fields, and he was absolutely, he was critical. He was very critical of the way they'd changed. And hmm. he he was not real real pleased with that. Uh, I, I, if my memory serves me, that it was indeed Dan, Dan Ingram, and I believe it was. I think it it. Uh, it very well may have been Ingram because he was really the only one of the the DJs that would say anything critical about mm-hmm. you know any of the records. But I think right. I think it grew on him very quickly because I can remember hearing mm-hmm. him maybe I don't know a week or so later play it and say this isn't this isn't a record this is an experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, I mean cousin mm-hmm. Brucey wouldn't have done that. No. Some of the other guys would, wouldn't have, you know, the lesser guys. And I don't think WMCA would have done that. And, you know, Murray the K wouldn't have done that. Right. Maybe Dan so, Daniel might have. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, he's about possible. But, uh, it's, but it seems to me that it was Dan Ingram because, yeah. I, because I was pretty well hooked into WABC at, mm-hmm. the, at that time. So, sure. Anyway. Could you, guys, could you guys answer a question about this? Because I was just thinking, was this the first time that you ever heard a song fade out and then fade back up again? On a mm. record, uh, I think mm. so because yeah, because RCA did it with Suspicious Minds, but that's two and a half years later, right? Uh, and that's the only other one I can remember. I, I I can't say for sure. I don't remember that. It may very well be possible, but yeah, probably. Yeah. I think we should also mention the video since we're on Strawberry Fields. I mean, mm. the, the, the videos mm-hmm. for that in Penny Lane were really incredible, um, and. Uh, you know, I mean, they were sort of bizarre and uh, quirky and, you know, had nothing to do particularly with the songs, although I think you saw a shot of Strawberry Fields for a second, Strawberry Field, yeah. uh, and and the Penny Lane bus. And, you know, so they were very tangentially related, but, mm-hmm. you know, the Beatles sitting out in a field at a table and the mm-hmm. bewigged servants bringing their yeah. instruments <laughs> and everything being kicked over and then, you know, jumping up the tree, you know, it's, it's just really a, a, a funny, weird video. And, you know, to us now, I mean, we're all waiting for the cleaned up versions exactly. of these things to, yeah. to come out mm-hmm. on the video one plus. Yeah. Um, hmm. But at the time, you know, I'm sure I know you've all seen the Dick Clark. Yes. Clip where oh, he yeah. Has them in black yeah. And they look to, like old men. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're not as good as the monkeys or somebody's yeah. grandfather. I mean, uh, you know, people just didn't know how to react or some people just didn't know how to react because as they were expecting, you know, what was the last thing they'd heard? You know, Yellow Submarine, probably, you right. know, mm-hmm. and uh, and suddenly this was very different. And uh, right. I think we didn't know what to make of it. Plus, right. and at that time, as silly as it sounds now for them to be growing mustaches and in George's case, that little kind of Van Dyke that he had, you know, it was, Oh, it was almost scandalous <laughs> that, that, Oh, how, Oh my goodness. Why, how are they, why are they growing mustaches? You know? Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We were, well, we were much younger yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the fascinating things about them is how they change yeah. not only musically, but also in their appearance. Exactly. And there are a lot of acts that try to copy that aspect of their careers. Sure. Mm-hmm. As you, as you, if you, if you change your appearance, you be, you maintain an interest because mm-hmm. you've got something new to present right. to people. You're not, mm-hmm. you're not staying exactly the same. And the Beatles were ahead of the curve on that. Oh, very much right. so. Right. Right. All right. So, Steve, why don't you pick uh, a miracle? Maybe your number one miracle My- of the Beatles as far as their music. Well, I'm glad you guys didn't. You, I was really nervous that uh, Alan, that you were going to pick mine, uh, but uh, you didn't. Um, mine would be a day in the life, even though you, we just finished talking about Strawberry Fields and partially about uh, Sergeant Pepper. Mm. I think uh, a day in the life is is just uh, astounding. Uh, it's I think it's brilliant. Never mind. I mean, just all the all the different things that are happening. 
not to mention the dog whistle at the end, not to mention the the long drawn out, the fade out. Um, I mean, the song the song itself is just so great. I mean, it uh, you know it, tra- it transitions from John to Paul and back to John, and it's just it, I mean, it's just incredible. It's just amazing. I there, there's not. I mean, I don't want to. I could go through all the, you know, the recording session that had all the, uh, you know, all the uh, guest stars on it. Um, the one of the few times that one of the uh, the only time I think a monkey was on a Beatles song, um, mm-hmm. you know. So I mean, it's it, it's just an amazing an amazing song, and I think if you have to uh, rank a piece, uh, you know, a Beatles songs is brilliant. Um, along with Strawberry Fields, of course, um, this one has to go. Uh, this one has to be mentioned. It's just, it, it's just a, a, an absolute brilliant piece of work. That's, that's about all I can say. So. Hmm. And again, George well, Martin played that... a, played an important part in it, doing the mm-hmm. orchestration. Right. And, yeah. and right. It. And you're making me think of, even though it's not on my list, there were several times when John and Paul would write a song together. And what each one wrote was something separate mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that they just fit into the song. Mm-hmm. A Day in the Life is is the perfect example of that. But you've also got I've got a feeling, mm-hmm. you know, with uh, right. Paul writing the verses and John writing the Everybody Had a Hard Hard Year, you know that part. And Baby You're a Rich Man is another example of that. John mm-hmm. writing the verses mm-hmm. and Paul writing the chorus. So, yeah. however the songs come together, no pun intended. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. they worked, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, that also is miraculous. And, yeah. and one, of the th- one of the things about this song is that the, the bootleg version, the outtakes are really, really interesting. The, the Mal Evans countdown. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's a trip. Um, mm-hmm. I remember the first time I heard that and the oh shit. I, I'm sorry, I said that. <laughs> but that the yeah, but the I remember I was uh, sitting in a I was in a store the first time I heard that, and I went really, I mean it was like <laughs> unbelievable, you know, and and that was just I mean when that outtake came out, I was I was astounded, and it was great to to hear that. Um, but I mean that you know there's just like I said there's just so much stuff happening in that song and it's just so much fun to listen to not only the song itself but all the the work that went into it um mm-hmm. and yeah so and the and also the video too the video on that is is great and it's going to be uh you know are we are we getting that in in one plus i i think we are yes yeah. yes, we are. Uh, yes we are so that's going to be interesting to see too the you mentioned now in the uh the original the uh strawberry fields video that's going to be oh man that's going to be yeah. that's going to be fantastic to see that in excellent quality <sighs> yeah anyway. you know um if you, everyone has access to youtube if they're hearing this they can, they can get sure. to there but uh it, universal has put up um and apple has put up uh, maybe a minute or two of of the cleaned up strawberry fields mm-hmm. on their YouTube channel. So you can see how good it looks and it really looks good. Mm-hmm. Um, Penny, it's absolutely. It's stunning. It's and, stunning. Yeah. Yeah. And Penny Lane too, they did that with Penny Lane too. Uh, yeah. With Penny Lane, they did the side by side of the cleaned up and unrestored with, with strawberry fields. They just gave you a, a minute and a half or so of the song, you know, mm-hmm. straight. And the funny thing is that the, you know, when we saw the anthology, uh, 20 years ago, impossible as that seems, I remember seeing at least not the entire clips, but obviously a good portion of the, the Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields uh, clips on on the anthology, and they looked, I think, probably better there than they had on, on any of the you know the previously sort of distributed uh, versions that had been out there, and so this will be even that much better. Yeah. You know, I uh, not to get off the subject, but I would guess that by next Christmas we'll have a anthology Blu-ray. That's just a, um, especially since the monkeys put theirs out. I think they're the Beatles will kind of be pushed into that. That's just a, a guess mm, on my part. Possible. I wouldn't mm. wouldn't surprise me at all. Wonder if they'll add extra stuff. Uh oh. That, that <laughs> no, but, 
<laughs> well, you know, um, a lot of us have seen, you've you've seen probably there was, there was a bootleg several years ago of an early cut of the anthology that has a bunch of stuff that didn't get into the finished cut. I'd like to see some of that, including since yeah. we're on a day in the life. I, I I don't think this was in the finished anthology, just in the original cut. George Martin plays the earlier ending where they try to sing Ohm, and it just didn't right. work. Um, mm. You know, in a certain way, I, I mean, on one hand, I was glad to have that because I'd always wanted to hear it and, and there it was and he played it. And But it was a little underwhelming and in, in a certain way. Maybe it's like this with the 27 minute Helter Skelter to mm. your our imaginations of what it might be are so much better than what it actually turns out to be when you hear it mm-hmm. and you realize that there's a reason they didn't use it, you know, yeah. but mm. um yeah, so there's more yeah. anthology stuff. I mean, hey, there's tons and tons of interview outtakes. They could be, they could. And well, yeah, as you say, let's not get off the subject wow. here. But <laughs> we were, <laughs> we were, t- we, it, I know, I know. We were talking. Well, I, just to I, I'd go on just another minute. We were talking before we got started about uh, Easter eggs on the One Plus DVD. That's going to be, mm. that's going to be crazy. That's going to be wild. Um, whatever they whatever they stick in there. Um, uh, we don't know how many there'll be. Yeah. No, we don't. We don't. How many? Yeah. They, I mean, they did that for the Yellow Submarine DVD, remember? But those outtakes weren't anything really, as I recall, they weren't anything. I mean, they're so, they're so memorable, I can't even remember what they are. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, who knows? Who knows what they'll do? Anyway. So we could do, it, we could do another round of these, couldn't we? Yeah, except that I never mentioned one right. from, from me. Yeah. <laughs> and we actually, did. Alan had my no- Alan had my number one pick, and Al had my number two pick. <laughs> so um, my number three <laughs> really is just a general comment here. Um, what's so funny? No. I only had four. Oh, okay. I just like the fact that you- <laughs> I think I, I think Alan had how many? How many? Do you I have? have one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. Okay. <laughs> All right. Number two so is have, a day I in have, the life, have... by the way. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, my number three pick is just based on something that Paul has said recently many times, which is that there were many times when he and John would write a song together, go into the studio. George and Ringo wouldn't even know the song, and they had to learn it and come up with it quickly. And so... A lot of what you're hearing as part of the Beatles catalog amounts to songs that George and Ringo had to develop parts for very quickly, as well as John and Paul. So there's a lot of spontaneity there (laughs) uh, of what happened in the studio, because so many of the songs were recorded in just a a day or a few days. And so they had to come up with the goods very quickly. It's not like they had months and months to work on these songs. You know, and Paul kind of every now and then, whenever he releases a new album and he says, this is how we did it in the Beatles, he kind of really misses the the time when so many decisions were made very quickly like that. Mm -hmm. So not counting uh, the very beginning of uh, their EMI catalog, because a lot of those songs, especially the covers, were part of their live repertoire, as were some of the, the early compositions. But once you started getting into more original material... It was all done so quickly, and that to me is quite miraculous. So many of these songs that we have burned in our brains now, where we know George's lead guitar solo so well, or his or his part, or what Ringo came up with, was all done fairly quickly. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying Sgt. Pepper because you know they took months on that album, but many of those songs, I think in particular before Pepper, were done fairly quickly in the studio and you can always go to lewison's notes for this but the mere fact that a lot of them were done in a few takes meant that they had to really develop and arrange the song very quickly so i think that is in and of itself miraculous when you think that these are songs that we treasure so much and you might think wow they must have spent so much time working on these songs and how they all came together well a lot of it wasn't that way Mm -hmm. So I think that is in and of itself a miracle. Sure. 
And when you listen to some of the outtakes on the anthology of things like Eight Days a Week and, um, mm. you know, some of the other things and, and you, you hear the things that are discarded, I mean, it, it's sort of the opposite of what I had said about that final chord on A Day in the Life. But they went through mm. some really good ideas that didn't get into the finished versions because – you know the ideas in the finished versions were, were were good too, and you can't you can't do it all. Although these days now people put out eighty five different remixes, and you can right. probably use mm. use any idea that you sure. think of. But but in those mm. days it was like okay, we're going to put out a version, and this is the version, and uh, the versions that got left behind. I, th- I think Paul said in some cases um, when he was listening to the anthology things, he was saying, hey, that, that thing we discarded was actually pretty good, wasn't it? You know, mm-hmm. And mm. uh, yeah, you know, I mean, they, you're right. They, they worked pretty fast and came up with ideas very quickly under some pressure, you know, I mean, probably less and less pressure as time went on because, you know, in the beginning, the idea was to get the album done quickly. And later on, you know, they're making money for EMI. EMI is not going to rush them out of the studio. So uh, probably the the biggest time constraint was John's impatience. You know, you hear him so many Hmm. times, yeah, let's get out of here, you know. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they... uh, even he, I'm sure, liked to experiment with different things. And even he, I mean, look what look happened in Strawberry Fields, you know. Um, he's impatient, but he had a, a vision of what he wanted and, and apparently never really captured it, you know. I mean, there's that story about George Martin talking to him in 1980 near the end of his life and John saying, I'd like to re-record all the songs, that I, all of my songs that I did with the Beatles and, you know, do them really good. And... George Martin said, even strawberry fields. And he said, especially strawberry fields. So who knows what his actual vision for it was, mm-hmm. you know, that he was not able to really capture with all those different versions. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, just, just bouncing off what, uh, what I had just said about the Beatles recording so quickly, a lot of their songs, they also had the best editing skills. I mean, they knew what their best material was. Mm-hmm. Because I really think that what they did release in that EMI catalog really was their best stuff. And uh, I know that this is probably cause for another show to debate this. But, you know, when you look at the other stuff that was left off, what made the Beatles anthology, I don't think that... I mean, I like that means a lot. Don't get me wrong. That's that's one of the few that I really... And leave my kitten alone. But I think by and large, you know, what they chose to release was their best material. And they yeah. arranged it. The, the best way that they could. They made mm-hmm. all the right decisions in that regard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, they knew, they knew intuitively what worked best. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, know, you know what to do, and if you've got trouble, they're simply not in the same class right. with, uh, with the songs that they actually released on um, right. the original right. albums. Right. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the amazing thing, especially about those – you know, say those three or four years, I guess, from September of 62 um, through the summer of 66 is, as you know, as, as Alan mentioned, the fact that, you know, they really, by necessity, had to finish these tracks in just a few, in basically just a few takes. You know, they weren't able to really stretch out because they might have to go from a, a, from recording at EMI one day, maybe even that night, to go to a BBC session and then, mm-hmm. uh, and then have, uh, you know, writing sessions or filming movies or, you know, for, you know sessions for photographers and then, of course, the tours. So there was right. so much packed into those those four years that it's it's absolutely amazing especially when you consider the growth of the music over those Mm -hmm. over those four years between love me do and revolver uh the the growth is absolutely Mm mind-boggling i think there was quite a lot of pressure on yeah exactly back then because they had to deliver by their contract two albums a year So if you had to have one done by Christmas, and that that was obviously a huge concern, the Christmas market, I always remember Rubber Soul being, well, one of the miracles, actually, yeah. because they didn't even start recording Rubber Soul till I think, October 4th right. 
of 65. The one thing I'm not sure about, maybe you guys can fill me in, is that were any of the songs from Rubber Soul written while they were recording the album? Because um, it's pretty remarkable. You got the 14 original songs, although two of them were leftover tracks right. with Wait and um, What Goes On. Mm-hmm. But then you've also got We Can Work It Out in Day Tripper as a single. So you had all these original songs. It was all original on Rubber Soul, and they hadn't even started until that first week of October. Sure. So you still had to not only record the songs, also have the single that was separate from the album, mm-hmm. do the photo session. It wasn't like you could just, you know, play something online like you can yeah. today. All that takes time. So <laughs> that's another miracle right yeah. there. But um, to do that all so quickly, I have a feeling Rubber Soul is one of those albums where, like Paul said, a lot of the decisions were made fairly quickly about the arrangements of them, mm-hmm. songs that he he and John wrote together. And Rubber Soul is one that I point to as one where I think there was a lot more collaborating between him and John than most people give them credit for. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. No question. No question. Well, they, about... they, they talk about songwriting sessions specifically for, for Rubber Soul because... Um, uh, you know, drive my car, for instance. And Paul was on his way to a songwriting session at John's house, and sort of thought that I thought of that on the way. You know, with his chauffeur or something. This, there was some incident. I can't remember what the details were, and it's not really important. But um, but then they worked on that. So you know, this is a, a period when they were turning it up at each other's houses, or mostly, I guess, at John's house, mm-hmm. to sit down mm-hmm. and write songs, and uh, and they had that you know, supposed rule about how if we don't come up with something in two hours, it's not going to be worth doing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But that's also yeah, or, why they had so many fragments that they joined together and the ones they had just worked so great. I mean, Day in the Life is in, is incredible. That those are two separate songs. Uh, they they fit. It, it becomes like a movie, you know. Um, hmm. All right. So, uh How about one of your other miracles there, since you got seven, Alan? Why don't you name another one? (laughs) Well, um, this one wasn't even actually initially on the list, but I started thinking of it when Steve was talking about A Day in the Life, and that is All You Need Is Love. There are some similarities with A Day in the Life in that they also brought in a lot of their friends to sit around, and in that case, uh, Donovan and Mick Jagger is there. I think Keith Richards is there, too bunch of people sort of in the in-studio audience were walking around at the end holding the signs that said, all you need is love in different languages. But this thing is, you know, they did the backing track. You know, for one thing, it captured the the spirit of, of that summer of love incredibly well. It became almost like a, a policy statement for the Beatles, you know, to be beamed across the world in the first satellite transmission. So they had done the backing tracks, and basically what you saw happening on television live was the the chamber group overdub and John's vocal. Um, and that's a lot of pressure to, you know, to, to sing that thing live in front of, what was it, 73 million, or I, I don't know, mm-hmm. it was... I think 73 million was Sullivan. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, this is more because this, this is the whole <laughs> yeah. world. <laughs> more, it's all yeah. around the world. And, yeah. you know, there you are. And, uh, you know, and all of your pals are sitting in the in the audience, in the studio. You know, again, for George Martin, this is, you know, he's sort of like in the frying pan there. You know, I mean, he's got to he's got to engineer this and have it go out and have the balances work and, you know, and come up with what would be more or less the finished recording. I think they redid the vocal the next day or something. But um, but we've heard that the vocal that they did because it's on the video clip and it's perfectly fine vocal. So, yeah, I mean, that in a way is another sort of technical miracle that also was a, a, a musical one, too, because it was the perfect song for the moment it was the perfect song for the occasion yeah. and yeah. and it came together with you know a, a, an arrangement with strings and and brass and uh and then the french stole the beginning is the national anthem right <laughs> <laughs> sorry couldn't help that. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. 
All right. Another fine example right there of a Beatle miracle. <laughs> Al, you got another one? Yeah. Uh, although this is a fair, this is a pretty well-known story because it, was, it became kind of a standard for both uh, George Martin and Walter Shenson, who produced The Hard Day's Night. And that is about the title song. The Beatles had, had recorded a number of songs for the soundtrack of what became a hard day's night and uh but they you know they didn't have a title for the film until fairly late when they came up with well with uh what had been a you know malapropism or a ringoism if you will a hard day's night and walter shenson you know said well you know we need we need a title song and we kind of need it very quickly like by tomorrow and uh, and they were uh, uh, John and Paul particularly were somewhat taken aback, but they uh, but by the next morning when they reported back for the day's filming, they uh, they had Walter Shenson come into the into the trailer and uh, John took out a, a matchbook cover and took out his guitar and played him the fully written and fully more or less arranged a hard day's night. And there you had the title to the film in, you know, probably record time. Hmm. Just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's a good song. I think there's so many miracles that nothing surprises us at this yeah. point. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Steve, you got one more? Yeah. Ex- mine, mine is probably a, a borderline music with a borderline social comment. Hmm. And that is for those uh, people uh, for those listeners that are first generation, mm. it it blows me away when I think about the fact, and I, maybe I'm I'm thinking about m- my personal situation, but I'm sure it must have been repeated. How many adults turned into Beatle fans in '64? It just it, up until that point, adults didn't like rock and roll at all. And starting, I, it all started, you know, the first night of the Ed Sullivan Show when they all you know, they basically wowed most of Amer- America, you know, and they converted a lot. They converted a lot of Beatle fans that night. A lot of the people they converted were your parents, my parents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that and and uh, where that really shows up is um, in I Want to Hold Your Hand, the movie, that great movie that is absolutely a, a wonderful thing to watch. But it's it, it for those who weren't there at the time that's how it was and um you know personally speaking my father didn't he was one of the few non-converts on february 9th it took him like three months when he saw the rolling stones and then he decided (laughs) (laughs) then he then he liked it then he realized that the beatles weren't so bad after all but uh, god god bless him he's no longer with us but that's the way you know i'm sure there were a lot of people the same way. The great scene in, in I Want to Hold Your Hand when the father forces the kid to go get the haircut, you know, and shoves him into the barber's chair. I'm, you know, I'm that those kind of I mean, there were a lot of things going on like that. But at the same time, you had people like um, Arthur Fiedler doing with the Boston Pops. Mm-hmm. And I was living in Boston at the time. And that was absolutely amazing that sure. Arthur Fiedler was a, was a Beatle fan. Yeah. And that story was repeated over and over and over again. And, yeah. uh, you know, the fact that they converted, that they made adult Beatle fans back in 64 was, was a miracle because it just did not happen. I mean, they were adults. They didn't convert everybody. For example, a lot of the press wasn't converted right away, mm-hmm. but they really did. Eventually, you know, they they a lot of people gained a lot more respect for rock and roll because of them, and so I think that has to be some kind of a miracle there. Well, in, in fact, I wrote about that in Change mm-hmm. the Times, 101 Days to Shape the Generation. Uh, the fact that the second song that the Beatles mm-hmm. performed in America was a Broadway show tune, Till There Was You, right. and sung by the most, as I pulled it, put it, the most mom-friendly uh, <laughs> of, of the four. And, you know, that immediately short-circuited any of the 
the kind of, oh, they're nothing but uh, the devil incarnate uh, stuff that had been that had been hurled at Elvis six years or eight years earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that went a long way. And, and as you, you mentioned, Arthur Fiedler, but, and his treatments, the Holly Rich Strings treatments, I've also mm -hmm. got this, this kind of, you know, um, farcical image in my mind of a, of a guy, uh, you know, a Don Draper type sitting at a bar in, uh, somewhere and, uh, one of the beautiful music radio stations of that era was would be playing over the 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 sound system in the bar and you'd hear say uh the holly ridge strings playing ps mm -hmm. i love you and mm -hmm. the, and the dj would come on and or not the dj but on the beautiful music stations there were announcers who would come on and so, you know announce all of the songs and say it was, it was the, the holly ridge strings performing the beatles a composition of P.S. I Love You. Mm -hmm. And the Don Draper type would look up at the bartender and say, the Beatles wrote that? That's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, there were, yeah. so there were converts, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the bottom line is that those just were great songs as songs yes. that stand up against any other songs. You know, I mean, Leonard Bernstein was was you know there with Arthur Fiedler in sure. the early days saying you know these these guys are the Schuberts of our time you know mm. yeah I think I, I my my parents didn't I think immediately uh, go for it when it was on Sullivan because I think the novelty of it or that you know to them it was just sort of funny but but I remember you know a couple of years later I had a, a, a guitar book of Beatles songs and I was playing some of them and and uh, all my love, and I seem to remember my mother coming in and saying, "That's the Beatles," you know. Yeah, <laughs> and same. you know, I mean, they they got to hear some of these songs in other contexts, and mm -hmm. they they heard the melodies, they heard, you know, they're, they're they're just great songs, and and the fact that they were did that they were doing the kind of stuff they were doing really just changed people's minds about them because it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, they couldn't say it's just noise because it had all the elements that make yeah. great songs great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the case of my parents, I certainly would never say they were converts. I don't recall there ever being a time when my father told me that he liked the Beatles. But uh, my mother certainly loved the ballads of the Beatles, and I love her, was a favorite of hers. And certainly any time people, certain, the, the great crooners or the great singers of the past covered a Beatles song, whether it's a Frank Sinatra or anybody, Jerry Vale, uh -huh. you know, the people that, that uh -huh. my parents listen to, um, if they're covering a Beatles song, then then they're recognizing that and appreciating it, appreciating it through those artists. So that's why it's kind of important every time Beatles material is covered. And it doesn't matter what kind of artist is covering it because it can reach new audiences, young and old. Mm hmm so and uh you know like i've said and you just said alan it's it's because they're great songs first exactly mm -hmm. that's what matters because then you know it could lend itself to so many different arrangements and that's why there are so many cover versions of of beatles songs mm -hmm. there's and more to it than that but uh yeah yeah but this is also why the first volume of Mark's Mark Lewison's book was such such a sort of mind bender you know for me because mm. it, it, you get the idea that the whole idea of writing for them was completely secondary that they wanted to they perceived themselves as a cover band and they they were not writing as prolifically as we had thought before they broke um mm. And that it it was you know largely because of an interest in one of their songs among a publisher related to EMI that that they sort of got heard again by EMI anyway after EMI had rejected them initially mm. and it was only then that they began writing in earnest and you think okay wait a minute historically with the wisdom of hindsight we think of the Beatles as you know a great rock band but you know with two maybe let's say three mm. of the best greatest composers you know of the 20th century um, certainly in pop music and that was an afterthought. It, I, it, 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 it's just hard to wrap my mind around that, you know. Mm -hmm. And yet, once they got their contract with EMI, they were pushing for their own material to be the singles. Yeah. Yep. 
So they were certainly thinking at that point about their own compositions, Absolutely. about being right. songwriters. Yeah. The big fight over how do you do it mm-hmm. at that point, you know, and they they wanted Love Me Do to be a single. They wanted Please Please Me to be a single. So um, they certainly were thinking of themselves as songwriters by that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that's I don't know that's why I for a long time and I'm 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 still not sure I'm totally convinced, but um, you know it's it's all of that that made me initially when I read Mark's book say no that, that can't be, it can't be we know that they you know on that 1960 <laughs> rehearsal tape they've got nine after nine one after nine oh nine and they've got I'll follow the sun and you know so it, it couldn't have been that unimportant to them. But um, I've talked to him about it, and he he insists. He says, you know, listen, I've talked to people who were there, who listened to them week after week. Their songs were not featured in their sets, and and they there was a sense that they were even a little embarrassed about their own songs. Mm-hmm. So it's it's just such a bizarre thing. I mean, <laughs> you know, when you talk about miracles. There's another miracle. That, yeah. You know. Someone got interested in their songs before they got signed and made them think, hey, maybe this is what we maybe this is our our uh, calling here, you know, that we should do our own songs and then got instantly almost militant about wanting their own songs to be on singles. Right. So it's just an incredible story all around, you know, it really is. I mean, even just, you know, the the whole thing about, you know, how do you do it? And, uh, you know, uh, no, no, we want to record our own stuff. You know, it, 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 even in those days, the average, uh, the average A&R man for a record company would say, you know, shut up, record what, you know, what I say you're going to record. Right. You right. Know, exactly. That sort of thing. But George Martin was, you know, he was, um, you know, liberal enough to, uh, you know, free, free minded enough to say, all right, well, uh, we'll give it a try. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but also, think about this. If Love Me Do hadn't made the, the dent that it did, yeah. and then Please Please Me was number one, if that didn't happen with those two singles, things could have went in a completely different direction with the Beatles. Yeah. George Martin could have insisted on the group uh, recording what he wanted. Exactly. So... Yeah. Well, yeah, he, well, he would have been out 36 pounds on the arrangement of Strawberry Fields. <laughs> <laughs> and he couldn't let that happen. <laughs> All right. This has been great. Before we go, we want to bring up a few other things. I know, Steve, you wanted to uh, talk about this thing about Harry Nilsson. Well, I wrote a story this week uh, about a, a movement by some fans online, and it actually is more than just fans because there are friends of Harry that knew Harry involved uh, too that want to get Harry into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and um, they uh, a song's been created and it's on YouTube and it's in the story I wrote the other day. Uh, but uh, that's uh, I'm just I'm really glad that somebody is working on that and. Uh, I hope it happens. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people that deserve to be in, and um, but Harry, it'd be great to see Harry in there. So, absolutely. Yeah, the the video is is called "Let's Put Harry in the Hall," mm-hmm. and there's uh, some 30 musicians and friends that got together and and wrote this original composition with references to Harry's songs in it. It's really nice, and not only that, but there's a Facebook page called Harry in the Hall, mm-hmm. and there's a website called HarryInTheHall.com. Mm-hmm. So you might want to check that out if you're a Harry Nilsson fan. One other really quick thing: um, if you're a Monkees fan, um, there uh, uh, some guy in England just put out a, a set called the MGM Mickey Dolan's MGM Singles Collection, and he did it with uh, with Mickey's uh, blessing, and it includes several takes. I can't remember how many of Daybreak. And Harry is also featured on one of the songs. Uh, I, I can't remember if it's Daybreak or, or uh, if it's another song, but Harry's Harry's on one. Of the, Harry and Mickey Dolans were very very close friends. Mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. that, that that that's. Uh, but for anybody that's a Monkeys fan and that's a a Harry fan, uh, you might be able. To, you might want to pick that up. It's on. It's a. It, it's been uh, issued in vinyl and on digital. It's not on CD yet. So. There you go. And I just wanted to to raise the question, especially to Al, because I know 
he's not a fan of these petitions or, or these movements mm. online to, to do these things. You don't think this has any influence at all? Not the on because there's every week there's a different online petition to put somebody in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they're you know none of them have any validity at, at all. You know they're just you know somebody, you know it's just you know more time wasting on Facebook. Basically, it's <laughs> uh, it's it's you know they really don't mean anything. But but the fact that that other you know that musicians especially people who were colleagues of Harry's are care enough to actually record a song to support something like this, you know, that carries a little bit more weight because they were, you know, obviously they were, as I said, colleagues of Harry, colleagues and friends uh, of Harry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously those of us who uh, uh, are involved with the Fest for Beatles fans, uh, Harry's very special to us too, because Harry was, very much a part of the fest in the uh, in the eighties, and right. you know, so we're not at all objective about uh, you know about Harry Nilsson. So who you know, I <laughs> I I must have a metal block. I keep thinking that he already is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and probably mm-hmm. should have been twenty years ago. You know, especially when while he was still alive, but uh, but unfortunately isn't. So he certainly belongs, but. I just I just don't believe in these online petitions because they're just basically time wasters. Mm-hmm. All right, well let me just let me just respond to that by asking you one question. Yeah. Al. What about in recent years the movement to get Brian Epstein in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? That did happen. And I know that Martin Lewis, at least he says well, he put a big yeah, effort well, behind that. Martin's, so Martin's do you just, think that had any influence at all? Martin says a lot of things. I, I don't think <laughs> I mean, Martin, you know, uh, actually Martin's efforts, since obviously he has a lot of contacts with people who are indeed close to the committee, you know, may have had uh, some impact. I think probably Vivek uh, uh, Tavari's, uh, you know, graphic novel, The Fifth Beetle, probably did as well. You know, I think there were a lot of other, a lot of efforts that were, you know, that were put into this that are totally independent of, you know, Facebook online petitions that probably carried more weight, including very possibly Martin's efforts uh, that, uh, you know, that carried more weight in, in getting, in getting Brian in than, uh, than, you know, online petitions. Hmm. But it could be that online petitions, you know, get it to the attention of some of the, musicians and people who say yeah that's a good idea let's make a song about harry and you know i mean who knows where some of these ideas come from but the idea that it's out there being discussed you know may help something i mean possibly it's it's all part of the big cosmic mix (laughs) yeah but you know more often than not it's like uh oh let's put uh you know joe foch my friend down the street let's put him in the rock and roll hall of fame (laughs) petition for that with about you know 20 names you mm-hmm. know it's yeah. Mm. Yeah. well the whole issue of the rock and roll hall of fame is is one that um you know fans have uh mixed feelings about yes. you know there are some who think that it's uh you know a complete joke and we in fact did an entire show on this mm-hmm. right around the time when ringo was inducted right. And um, so it would be. I would. I would definitely suggest to our listeners, if you haven't heard that show, to go back a bit and listen to that one. There are so many artists that are worthy of being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that have not been inducted. Harry is certainly one of the many, yeah. and uh, certainly because I know that he has a special place in the hearts of a lot of Beatle fans. And uh, we also know that that Ringo has said uh-huh. that Harry was his best friend. Absolutely. Uh-huh. And you might have thought. You might have thought he, he would have picked one of the other Beatles, but he has said on several occasions Harry was his best friend. So he has a special place in Ringo's heart. Maybe, you know, since Paul was a bit instrumental in getting Ringo in the Hall of Fame, maybe Ringo could do some arm twisting. Ringo didn't. Who knows? Even, Ringo wouldn't even um, contribute to the um, Harry Nilsson documentary because it was. It, uh, Harry meant so much to him. He couldn't yeah, do it. Yeah, right. He said he couldn't do it. It just he would not go on camera because mm-hmm. he said he just would not be able to 
you know, do it straight faced. You know, he right. he'd yeah. break down. Right. Which so, I can see, which I can yeah. certainly understand, having seen the film. And mm-hmm. I, every time I've seen it, I've been a blubbering mess at the end of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, this has been a great show. And uh, let's just say that if any of our listeners would like to get in touch with us, we do have an email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page at things we said today. We have a Twitter account as well. Mm-hmm. Steve, do you remember what that is? <laughs> <laughs> things we said fab is, is, the, um, is the account. Okay. And uh, also, if any of you would like to get in touch with me, Ken Michaels, my uh, direct email address is everylittlething at att.net. And by all means, please check out my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. There's uh, Beatles trivia offered every single week on my on my website, and you have a choice of one of nine prizes every week. And there might be a special contest being posted on my website by the time the show goes up. Don't want to say anything unless it's definite, but that's something else to uh, look forward to, because in addition to the trivia, I do have these other contests and lots of great interviews with people in the Beatle world, including glorious interviews with each member of our esteemed panel here of co-hosts. So you can hear. Yes. (laughs) We're all esteemed. Oh, I thought you meant I thought you said we were esteemed. No, <laughs> I don't know. The weather out here is so hot. It's, it's, it's getting cool up here. <laughs> oh, quiet. <laughs> All right. Uh, would any of you like to plug anything? I just want to say I enjoyed seeing the Yankees beat the Mets 5 nothing the other day. <laughs> you know... I, I always I always take the high road and I'm not going to I'm not going to respond to that. OK, I'm just going to pray that the Mets make the postseason the way they're playing the last few days. Yeah. But uh, one of our colleagues, Darren DeVivo, is going to uh, the Mets game tomorrow night. That's Tuesday night. So I hope that they do well at that game, you know, and uh, I certainly hope they clinch first place very soon because it's starting to yeah. get a little bit a little bit tight in that race. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever gets in, uh, whoever gets in, please beat the Dodgers. Thank you. <laughs> so there. Okay. All right. This has been wonderful. Let me let me say ahead, one, one, let me say one real quick thing to uh, off. And we were talking about this before on the um, the one DVD thing. There is a for those people that need to buy everything. There is an SHM CD being rele- of one being released only in Japan. So there. Okay, I'm done. Now you can. Now you can. You, now you can uh, end it, Ken. Sorry. Okay. All right. So we're going to have a show very soon on those very CDs, aren't we? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we're all going to get the SHM CDs. This is like you know what John said on WNEW for the for the four yeah. people who buy Quad. <laughs> Ringo for or Ringo the, for the sixty people that buy his CDs. Right. Whatever. All right, so for Things We Said Today, this has been Ken Michaels being joined by Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, and Alan Cozen, thanking you all for listening, and we will see you next time. Next time.